I'm Joel Alisea. I'm a non-resident fellow here at AEI and a law professor at the Catholic University of America. Most relevantly, I'm the co-director of the Project on Constitutional Originalism and the Catholic Intellectual Tradition at Catholic University, or CIT for short. CIT is a co-sponsor of this conference, along with AEI, the Pepperdine University School of Public Policy, and the Ethics and Public Policy Center. I know I speak not only for CIT, but also for Pepperdine and EPPC, when I thank AEI, and especially Yuval Levin, for generously agreeing to host this conference and for the great work of the staff here in organizing it. CIT explores the relevance of the Catholic intellectual tradition for American constitutionalism, and one of the ways we do that is by sponsoring conferences and events like this one. You can learn more about, it, about us at cit.catholic.edu. This is exactly the kind of conference that CIT is interested in sponsoring, because as I'll discuss in my remarks during the final panel tomorrow, where I'll be a panelist, foundational questions of constitutional law cannot be divorced from foundational questions of political morality. And in the last 30 years, few books on political morality have been as important as Making Men Moral. Over the next two days, we will explore what made the book essential reading when it was first published, as well as its continuing relevance today. And I want to stress that the book does remain very relevant to today's debate. We live in a time of increasing skepticism of liberalism in, on both the right and the left. On the right, many have criticized liberalism as morally empty proceduralism and as a failed attempt to cleanse the public square of robust moral claims, including those from within the Catholic intellectual tradition. And on the left, many have echoed the same charge of morally empty proceduralism and have criticized liberalism for being insufficiently radical on matters pertaining to race, sex, gender, economic redistribution, and other issues. What makes Making Men Moral so relevant to these debates is that it is both critical of liberalism as an ideology or political philosophy and sympathetic to some of the values and principles, especially in the domain of civil liberties, for which liberals claim to be the foremost champions, if not indeed the discoverers. It argues that liberal moral and anthropological ideas cannot provide a truly secure basis for these values and principles and proposes an alternative set of moral and anthropological ideas drawn from the natural law tradition that might place them on a more solid footing and shape them in ways that are consistent with a due regard for public morality. If you are dissatisfied with aspects of the liberal tradition or if you just generally seek a, an intellectually rigorous and morally serious way to think through the tumultuous political debates of our time, you would do well to begin by reading Making Men Moral. It is therefore right that we mark the 30th anniversary of the book's publication with this conference, and we have a truly stellar cast of panelists and speakers over the next two days. We're going to kick things off with a conversation with the book's author, Professor Robert P. George, an AI non-resident senior fellow and Princeton's McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence. He'll be interviewed by the president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center, a co-sponsor of this conference, Ryan T. Anderson. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Well, thank you, uh, Joel, and uh, thank you to everyone for being here. This is a, a great turnout. Um, <clears throat> and I should also uh, thank Joel. He did the yeoman share of the four co-sponsoring organizations in organizing things, and so um, thank you for that. Um, and thank you to AEI. Um, at EPPC, we don't have a facility like this, and this is beautiful. It's a beautiful building, beautiful room to be gathered in. Um, I want to start by, most of you know who Robbie is, but I want to say just a little bit about Robbie for those of you who don't know him um, as well as I do. My first job out of college, I was an undergraduate at Princeton. I had the good fortune of not taking any of his classes, which meant I did not kill my GPA because um, Robbie doesn't believe in giving A's. Um, I was a music major, so I had no reason to take any of his classes. But then I was his research assistant because none of his students actually agreed with him. And it was actually hard to find a Princeton graduating senior who agreed with Robbie. And so my first job for him was to help him with his book titled Embryo, A Defense of Human Life. Then it was helping him with work uh, in the defense of marriage. And then the, you know, the rest is history because we've now co-authored a number of um, articles, books, op-eds, et cetera, et cetera. He's also now my um, board uh, vice chair, so he's my boss. Um, so he's still my boss 20 years later. <laughs> um, but for those of you who don't know him as well as um, some of our, uh, his students do, he grew up in West Virginia uh, picking banjos, um, <laughs> then went to Swarthmore uh, undergrad for college, um, Harvard for law school and for divinity school. Not as many people know that he has um, the degree from Harvard Divinity School. And then Oxford 
uh, for his doctoral studies, where he studied uh, with John Finnis, with Joseph Raz, with Ronald Dworkin. Uh, and the reason I mention those names, two of those people uh, have chapters devoted to them uh, where they come in for pretty searing critiques uh, from Robbie. And then the third person he utilizes in making those critiques. So um, the book itself um, uh, uh, spares no, uh, pulls no punches, I guess is the way of saying it. And when he finished his education at Oxford, he lands first-time job, tenure-track job at Princeton. And this is the book that he writes in an attempt to get tenure at Princeton, <laughs> criticizing the reigning orthodoxy of the Princeton Politics Department, <laughs> criticizing two of his uh, advisors and mentors at Oxford, and deploying a theory of natural law that was fairly controversial, even within natural law circles. Um, so that's where I want to start, because th- th- there's more I could say. He's an advisor to popes and to presidents. Um, you know, he served on the U.S. Commission of Civil Rights. Not, not this pope, not this president. <laughs> 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 you, you said it, not I. Um, various U.S. commissions on civil rights, on bioethics, um, international religious liberty, and a lot of other things. And we're going to get to some of those other things later on with the questions. But I want to start with the book, um, because you're an untenured professor at Princeton, and you write this. What were you hoping to accomplish? Uh, well, first, uh, let me uh, thank the American Enterprise Institute for hosting today and uh, thank uh, the co-sponsors of this uh, event. Special thanks to the driving forces, Joel Alessia of Catholic University and Pete Peterson. Where is Pete? Pete uh, is right there from the School of uh, Public Policy at uh, Pepperdine University, where I have the honor of being an honorary uh, professor. And of course, Ryan Anderson and the Ethics and Public uh, Policy Center and AEI, and especially my beloved friend, Yuval Levin and his boss, uh, Robert Doerr, uh, for, for hosting this. It's wonderful to have the opportunity uh, to come back and revisit this uh, book 30 years later, and you guys can tell me what I got uh, wrong. <laughs> uh, I still can't find anything in there I disagree with, so I'm going to uh, be on the spot to defend all the stuff that I said in the book. I'm not going to take the easy way out by saying, oh, I no longer agree with, uh, I no longer agree with that. Uh, Well, what was I trying to accomplish? I wanted to uh, overthrow liberalism. Um, (laughs) The liberalism of the time, in any case, uh, what what was regarded as liberal theory. I think it's very important, uh, especially for younger people, to understand the way in which the towering figure of John Rawls Mm -hmm. hovered over academic political theory political philosophy uh, in those days, really from the publication of his first book, A Theory of Justice, in 1971, um, forward. Rawls was the dominant and dominating uh, theorist. His general approach to liberalism, the so-called anti-perfectionist approach, uh, was adopted by the leading political philosophers, many, many of the leading political philosophers of his time, Uh, including those whose uh, work was also important in philosophy of law, such as my teacher, uh, Ronald Dworkin. And the basic idea there was that for justice to be done, law and public policy, uh, especially on controversial questions and certainly on questions of what Rawls would later call constitutional essentials and matters of basic justice, law and policy must avoid being based on appeals to premises about what makes for or detracts from a valuable and morally worthy way of life. That's the concept of um, anti-perfectionism, that law should be, for all intents and purposes, neutral as to questions of meaning and value, goodness, in order to be just. And Rawls develops an elaborate theory with a uh, wonderful heuristic device known as the original position. I'm sure We'll go into that a lot over the course of the next two days in order to uh, show how you would make public policy if you adopted those anti-perfectionist uh, premises. And by the time A came along, by the time I was in college, this was orthodoxy. Uh, and certainly in graduate school, when I was in graduate school, this was uh, orthodoxy. Almost everybody, apart from those on the far left, apart from, from the, the Marxist wing of political theory, Just about everybody 
accepted some version of anti-perfectionist liberalism, not only as the correct liberalism, but as the correct political philosophy, and it just seemed to me to be wrong. So I have two follow-ups. Um, first, you said you wanted to overthrow liberalism. Right. But I have reliably been informed by people on Twitter, including former colleagues of yours at Princeton, that you actually are a right liberal yeah. and that you are a defender of liberalism. Can you explain the apparent tension? Uh, well, <laughs> in the final chapter of Making Men Moral, um, I propound a theory of civil liberties that defends basic civil liberties principles, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, the right to petition the government for redress of grievances, uh, due process of law, the equal protection of the laws. I defend those as true and good uh, principles, although I argue that they should not be defended the way liberals defend them, nor should they be understood the way at least the liberals of those days, the Rawls and Dworkin type liberals understood them, that there's a better way to understand them and there's a more secure foundation for them. And here I'm drawing on the natural law tradition going all the way back into uh, antiquity, you know, the drawing on the writings of Plato and Aristotle, medieval thinkers such as Aquinas, a certain Enlightenment thinkers, uh, modern thinkers such as my teacher John Finnis, or contemporary thinkers uh, such as John Finnis. Uh, so I wanted to show that there's a better way to defend those liberties um, uh, on, on questions on which conservatives and liberals tend to disagree. I thought I could also show that conservatives generally have the superior understanding of the scope and limits and the contours of of those liberties. And I guess it's because I actually do believe in freedom of speech and freedom of religion and freedom of assembly and freedom of the press and due process of law and equal protection of the laws that some people who style themselves now as being on the conservative side regard me as a liberal. But I haven't changed. I'm the same guy. So the same guy who was known as a ferocious critic of liberalism in 1993 when this book was published believes everything that he did then but from the perspective of some people now on the right, that makes that guy a liberal. All right, and so then um, the second follow-up, and you, and you hit on it actually with your answer just now, when you mentioned Aristotle and Aquinas, what you refer to as the central tradition in the book, in that, that first substantive chapter, um, you kind of sketch that out as an alternative to um, reigning liberal orthodoxy, but you also make some criticisms of it. Mm -hmm. Can you sketch both what you describe as the central tradition and then what you think of as some of the limitations to that tradition and what you were trying to refine there. Well, the label, the central tradition, I, I borrow from uh, the great liberal uh, thinker, Sir Isaiah Berlin. Uh, Berlin uh, names that tradition that begins with the Greeks and goes up through the medievals and through the Renaissance and Reformation and even into the and through the Enlightenment as the, as the central uh, uh, tradition the tradition that is now abandoned by modern contemporary liberals, uh, not only of the Rawls-Dworkin sort, but also of the Obama-Biden-Schumer uh, sort in, in politics. Uh, and so I wanted to show that uh, there was much that was sound that was being thrown overboard by contemporary liberals in the central tradition. And indeed, the central tradition had the resources within it on which we could draw to reform the parts that were not sound. Now, why were the parts that were unsound unsound, in my opinion? Uh, I think they were unsound because they failed to attend to the ways in which basic civil liberties do need to be in place securely for the ultimate goal, which is the integral flourishing of human beings to be achieved. If we understand the Aristotelian principle of odiomania properly, we will see that even figures like Aristotle, and in some respects Aquinas and others, are simply failing to see the respects in which certain liberties that they themselves were not prepared to defend or embrace really need to be embraced and defended if human beings are, uh, are, are to flourish. Which led me many years later uh, to join together with a brilliant young fellow who was a friend of mine and former research assistant to write a paper called The Baby in the Bathwater, <laughs> where essentially we said, uh, don't throw out the, uh, uh, the baby uh, with, uh, with the bathwater, just as, uh, as there are some truths that are defended by uh, uh, liberals, even though they're wrong, about the foundations of those truths and about the contours of the, in some respects, the contours of the liberties that they want to defend. There are, uh, we we, we want to preserve the truths while correcting the stuff that's wrong. Well, the same could be said of the central tradition from another perspective. 
uh, there are very important truths. I think it's fundamentally sound, for example, in its understanding that ethics has to be based on a concern for the well-being, the flourishing, the fulfillment of human beings in the manifold dimensions in which we uh, can be fulfilled. But at the same time, uh, if you attend to what that flourishing does require, you'll see that the medievals and the ancients very often failed to understand the importance of what we would today call civil liberties. So, so it sounds like what you're arguing here is for a both and, which is the subtitle of the book, Civil Liberties and Public Morality. That's correct. And that a lot of um, your critics, both today and 30 years ago, tend to overemphasize one or the other. And you want to hold both together, and with a certain amount of tension, a constructive tension. I'm not sure that there's all that much tension. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, my, my point is that our concern for public morality and our concern for civil liberties are rooted in the same considerations, and that is the flourishing, the well-being, the fulfillment of the human being in the manifold dimensions in which we are to be fulfilled. Uh, one of my foundational arguments, uh, and here I'm, I'm drawing heavily on Professor Finnis, who in turn is drawing heavily on Aquinas, who in turn is drawing heavily on Aristotle, is that the human good is variegated. Uh, the goods of the human being, the respects in which we can flourish are variegated. There's not just one human good. Uh, there are many diverse, irreducible forms of or aspects of human well-being and, and fulfillment. Uh, and we've got to attend to all of them and give all of them their due if we're to establish sound principles of morality, including principles of, of justice. So that's what I try to do, and I try to show that this consideration of these principles integrally conceived, uh, will give us the need for respect for basic liberties like freedom of speech, freedom of religion, due process of law, equal protection, but also a concern for public morality. We, 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 would, we would make a very bad mistake if we went down the Rawlsian to Kenyan road and tried to fashion our public policy without regard for what makes for it attracts from a valuable and morally worthy way of life. But that doesn't mean that we would do well to abandon basic civil liberties. Yep. L let me say one word about why, why I think you do think there's a healthy tension. Um, just because even in the answer you gave there, when you, you point to the example of free speech, there is a certain critic of free speech who's focused so much on public morality that they want to ban hate speech or they want to ban speech that truly is immoral. And you would agree that that agree. speech act is immoral but you think it does deserve the law's protection. Um, and that's the tension I'm getting at. And, 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 well, okay, and I invite so you just to say a few words if, uh, about if, that. If that's, if that's the tension, yeah. So yeah. that's a tension. Uh, but the, I, I want to stress that my concern for freedom of speech is rooted in the same concerns that uh, uh, support my, con my uh, defense of public morality. Mm -hmm. And that is the well-being, the flourishing of human beings. The very thing that the dominant liberals of the second half of the 20th century into the 21st century said were illegitimate bases for the fashioning of law and public policy. A concern for the well-being, the flourishing of human beings, the human good. Remember Rawls's principle, the priority of the right to the good. Right? We, we, we need to fashion uh, our conceptions of political justice, including our conceptions of rights, independently of controversial ideas of the human good, what makes for it attracts from a val valuable and morally worthy way of life. That's what I think is wrong. And I think if we do attend to what makes for or detracts from a valuable and morally worthy way of life, we're going to see that we need protection for public morality and we need protection for civil liberties. Now, can people exercise their liberties in ways that harm public morality? The answer to that is yes. If that's the tension you're interested in, then yes. Yeah. I'll say there is, a, there is a tension. But the concern is rooted in the same set of foundational principles. And the reason I mention that is it, it strikes me that there's impatience on both the left and the right um, wanting to promote a vision of the good, and everyone has a vision of the good, to kind of short circuit some of the laws that actually will, over the long run, get us to that good. And so like what you just described there, you may need to tolerate certain immoral speech acts and even protect them in law precisely for the good of uh, pursuit of truth, knowledge, and, and, and the And this truth. is no novel claim of mine. 
nor can I accuse the central tradition of having uh, failed to notice it. Uh, Aquinas himself, uh, in the sections of the Summa Theologia, which have, uh, we've come to call the Treatise on Law, uh, raises the question, uh, can you enforce all the virtues? Can you prohibit all the vices? And, and the answer is no, you can't enforce all the virtues or prohibit all the, the, the vices. This, and again, for the same reasons I say that, you, uh, the, the, the very considerations that lead you to judge such and so to be morally good or morally bad will sometimes lead you to consider that we would do more harm than good if we tried to, for example, ban this or that. Yep. So, so let's conduct. turn more to, to, to Rawls, Dworkin, Waldron, all the, the, the bad guys as, as you know, the people you're engaging in the book. Um, say a little bit more about the anti-perfectionism and then also the uh, paternalism. Because I think sometimes those two ideas get mm-hmm. conflated. Because you know, one's dealing with you know, what are we looking to when we think about fundamental justice and law. And the other is the question of can the state promote some conception of the good and can the state prohibit some conception of uh, self-regarding evil. We'll put it that way. Um, So here I think it's important to introduce another distinction that I rely on heavily in the book, and that is the distinction between principled grounds for governmental restraint or withdrawal and prudential grounds. Um, I think that the liberalism I'm criticizing, the Rawlsian, Dworkinian, anti-perfectionist liberalism, vastly exaggerates the um, extent to which principle forbids governmental intrusion into certain spheres of life. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't good reasons for government to recede or uh, uh, avoid getting, for example, too deeply into family matters, even if bad things are going on in the family. Sometimes the government's got to intervene, child abuse, spousal uh, 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 domestic violence, those kinds of things. But in general, you don't want the government going in there less as a matter of principle more as a matter of prudence. The government's going to do a lot more harm than good. Uh, there will be too many opportunities for the government, governmental abuse of power. The things we're seeing right now when, with government intruding into family uh, decision-making. So you know, that was a, a, a distinction that I wanted to revive, right. the distinction between prudential reasons for governmental restraint and, and principled reasons. So... Uh, I, my, I was critical of what Harry Blackman would call the right to privacy, what Ronald Dworkin called the right to moral uh, independence, this idea that it's unjust to prohibit certain forms of immoral behavior. There's sometimes good reasons not to prohibit certain forms of immoral behavior. Aquinas himself says so. But it's not because they would be unjust in principle. It's because of the harm to human well-being that would likely come as a result of government intrusion. Either government would do it badly, or there are too many opportunities for abuse, or there would be so many negative externalities, or they would be so severe that uh, you know, we would be better off tolerating the vices. So how does what you just described, um, your own vision, the Rawlsian, Dworkinian vision, um, how do those two compare to the founders' vision of liberalism? Oh, okay. Well, I want to claim the founders as my own, (laughs) of course. Uh, Yeah, I mean, the founders... Sometimes people go wrong here because they imagine that the founders' political morality is embodied precisely in their design for the national government. And, of course, their design for the national government is for a government of delegated and enumerated uh, powers. So there are going to be lots of things that are out of bounds for the national government. I don't think we should read them as saying, therefore, we believe no government should ever do those things or intrude into those areas. We have to remember that they understood the states as governments of general jurisdiction exercising police powers, and it's in the states that considerations of human well-being, it's in the states that the kinds of considerations that Rawls would want to rule out the founders would see as perfectly legitimate, and I see as perfectly uh, legitimate as well. Yeah. And that will sometimes extend to uh, paternalistic laws. So in the book, I'm prepared to defend uh, laws against um, uh, not wearing a seat belt, uh, requiring wearing a motorcycle helmet, uh, laws against the use of recreational drugs, those sorts of things, even in their paternalistic dimension. Now, lots of times you have laws that are, that are uh, motivated by a mix of considerations or a mix of motivations, some of which are paternalistic, 
some uh, of which are not. But I'm prepared to defend even the paternalistic aspects. I, I only want to stay on the book for another minute or two before getting to other aspects of um, the past 30 years for you. Um, but, you know, I, I reread the book over the past two weeks, um, which was interesting because, as you can see on the cover here, um, the cover is a little um, provocative um, for children. <laughs> and so I got many questions from my children as they saw me sitting by the fire reading this. Um, but all of the questions were focused on why is the mother dropping the baby? Why isn't anyone catching the baby? What, so it, it, I think as they get older, there'll be other questions um, that are asked when I reread the book. Um, but one of the most interesting, and, and it was helpful for me because I had forgotten this part, um, where you distinguish the two senses of our t- autonomy. It's in the chapter where you're um, discussing Joseph Raz. Um, and, and in particular, when you talk about like what Kant himself was prepared to defend versus what today's Kantians are willing to defend, it's the personal autonomy and the, the moral autonomy. Can you just explain in kind of accessible language what that is? Because I think that actually drives a lot of misunderstandings about autonomy today. Sure. Uh, So when you speak of autonomy today, people will hear you as speaking of um, uh, the people being able to do whatever they want, being able to do what they want, whatever it is they want to do. Well, that's one meaning of the term autonomy, and it's the dominant meaning uh, today. But there's an older uh, meaning, uh, one that still occasionally run into. It's still uh, in use in moral philosophy. And this is where autonomy means having complete control over your desires. So you're not doing whatever you want to do. You're doing what you believe based on faith or reason or both you should do, even in the face of powerful motives to act on uh, these wayward desires. So the truly autonomous person is the truly self-possessed person, the person who has the virtue of self-mastery. Again, that's the opposite of what your typical college dorm discussion means by autonomy. If the word comes up at all, it means, you know, doing whatever you want to do. And and which, uh, a a closely related word, liberty, Mm -hmm. which conception of liberty um, would you say the founders would have had? Oh, well, of course. Because it strikes me that the the, the true versions of autonomy you just gave, you can distinguish liberty from license in a way that a certain conception of liberty today can't make that distinction. Yeah, you've anticipated the answer to the question. The, the famously, or uh, I suppose from one point of view, infamously, the founders distinguish freedom from license or liberty from uh, uh, license. Uh, liberty is uh, the liberty to make reasonable decisions within the domain of one's life uh, so that one can, in fact, be the author of one's life, what Joseph Reyes says we should aspire to, autonomy in that uh, sense. Yes, that's what they meant by uh, liberty, but that did not mean the right to make unreasonable or immoral uh, decisions. Now, there may be some reasons, again, uh, for law and the state to stay their hands when it comes to prohibiting certain sorts of acts, even if they are immoral, but we would still recognize those not as acts of liberty, but as abuses of liberty or acts of license, licentiousness. Um, So moving beyond the book to the book's reception a little bit, What do you think the reaction um, from the left has been, the liberal left here? Uh, Have they learned from the book? Do they still disagree with it? Has there been any movement there? And then on the flip side, your critics on the right. Like, how how do you kind of situate where the book is today, Hmm. given both um, academic debates about political theory, but also then on the ground debates about politics? Um, Well... For the first half of that question, uh, how was it received by the left? I got tenure. (laughs) Uh, And there were no conservatives in my department. Uh, uh, Well, there was one, actually. There was just John DiIulio, the great John DiIulio, who was uh, uh, here, one conservative. He was a Democrat, but still a conservative in the the department when uh, when I was coming up for tenure. Um, So I think the book was received as, well, you know, um, he's wrong, uh, but uh, he's got some important things to say here. He raises some challenges that really do need to be answered. Uh, I think for some of my critics, and some were even kind enough to say, we don't quite know how to answer him. We're sure he's wrong, but we're not quite sure how he's, they have faith. he's wrong. So we're, yeah, I have faith, exactly. Uh, you know, uh, the, the great, uh, late, wonderful man, uh, liberal uh, political philosopher, 
uh, Jeffrey Murphy mm -hmm. you know, wrote in his review that I have to admit that uh, Professor George was a book has made me very nervous about my commitments yeah. to liberalism. Well, I'll take that. I mean, yeah. that, that said to me, you know, I've made some points that are at least challenging people on the left and, and making them think. Now, my real nightmare is this, that the contemporary leftist who was not around in uh, 1993 but uh, might have now run into the book might look at it and say, it's oh, right. yeah, yeah, he's right. You know, neutralist liberalism, that's completely wrong. It's not only can, can law not be neutral, as, as George says, all his arguments work. Law shouldn't be neutral with respect to fundamental moral questions. Law should embody a vision, and law should be willing to impose that, that vision. And we're doing it. Uh, you know, transgenderism, uh, uh, woke ideology, this is, this is not neutral. And, and, and Robert George has licensed us because he says we... Don't have to be well, neutral. I mean, wouldn't you say that's what's really going on with the Baker, the florist, a photographer? I mean, this isn't oh, about absolutely. blocking access to certain goods. No, it's because about morals legislation. Yeah, that's, that's right. But, but civil rights legislation generally is morals legislation. It, it works by creating a certain, helping to, to, to establish and maintain a certain moral ecology, as I say in the book, a certain set of understandings and expectations that inform people's Consciousness, their ideas, their 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 beliefs. So uh, yeah, I mean, I think Which, people on the, on today's left could say, oh yeah, you know, he's completely right about his critique of Rawls and Dworkin and yeah. the old liberalism. And uh, so so we're taking him at his word. We're taking his advice. We're we're going to impose a moral vision here. Now I wish they'd read that last chapter about <laughs> respect for civil liberties, yeah. but uh, maybe they'll get there eventually. It's interesting that none of the Rawlsians came to the defense of the baker, or the florist, or the photographer. Uh, is that quite right? Um, help me out, Sharif Girgis. Sharif is in the room. I think maybe someone like Andy Koppelman uh, stepped up to defend at least some of the claims of the baker and the florist. Uh, Sharif has disappeared. No, he's over there. I'm just thinking. Yeah. I, I, do, I do think there are there were he was a few. More of, sympathetic than I think that the there rest, are a few. If Andy is not a good example, I'll have to check with Andy on this or look at look up some of his writings. If, if not, Andy, I, I do think there were a small number of believers in the old-time religion of liberalism who said, yeah, you know, we've got to give some room at least for the florist and the, and the baker and the wedding planner. How about um, reception on the right and today's debates? Um, well, the, the critique from the right is, is exactly what uh, you mentioned earlier, and that is that, or I'm sorry, Joel, yeah. Joel mentioned in his introduction that uh, that uh, they think I've actually bought in to, at least to some extent, bought into Rawlsian liberalism. So they're not so thrilled about that last chapter, which which does provide the strong defense of uh, of civil liberties, uh, because it it does look to them too libertarian. It, it looks to them uh, uh, as though I'm allowing for too much bad conduct uh, under, the, under the banner of, of civil liberties. So they would want to um, repress or at least authorize or license the repression of some forms of bad speech, um, hate speech, for example, um, that, um, that if, you, if you buy my argument, we shouldn't, we shouldn't repress. Yeah. Not, not because the speech is good, but because the human good on the whole is served by um, uh, allowing for robust free speech. I mean, basically, in, in that chapter, I go a long way along with somebody who I criticize in much of the rest of the book, and that is John Stuart Mill. If you look at Mill's second chapter of On Liberty, uh, the chapter called Of Liberty and Thought and, of Thought and Discussion, Mill makes the case for freedom of speech, a very strong case for a very robust conception of freedom of speech, not on the basis of there not being any truth. Mill believes there is a truth, but on the basis of the claim that we need to be able to engage each other, challenge each other, put controversial theses on the table, uh, consider radical ideas, if we are to move from, being fallible human beings, move from error to truth or get deeper into the truth or get closer to it or acquire a deeper understanding of the truth. And that all seems right to me. I have my own critique of Mill, and most of, the, most of what I say about Mill in the book is, is negative, but I do think that he's right about that. What Mill gives us 
uh, is a perfectionist yeah. account of liberalism. Um, and so when it comes to something like free speech, he and I are really on the same page. Now, of course, I'm not a utilitarian, and he is. Although, uh, as my uh, student who will be on the program later, uh, John DiUlio, young John DiUlio, uh, argues in his wonderful uh, new book, you know, Mill might not be quite so distant from Aristotle as uh, we all thought. So um, when you mention Mill and free speech and some of your work on academic freedom, um, it leads me to ask you a personal question. All of the debates that you've been engaged in, written debates, you know, public debates, um, talking with your colleagues, on what issues have, have those led you to change your mind? I know you said in the book you haven't changed your mind on anything in the book, but I imagine there are things over the past 40 years that you've been in university life where you've reconsidered things because of exchanges you've had. Or maybe not. No. (laughs) (laughs) You know, uh, one area in which I I do think um, uh, I've certainly gotten a much richer understanding uh, of some issues is uh, in my engagement with my friend Cornell West, who is not a liberal. He's very much on the left, uh, the the sort of... um, Although he does have also some civil libertarian um, uh, principles as well. So we, we share some of those. In fact, we've written together in defense of, of free speech. You might have seen our 2017 statement, Truth Seeking Democracy and uh, Freedom of Thought and Expression. But in my engagement with Cornell, uh, I have, I think, gotten a deeper appreciation of uh, the impossibility, strictly speaking, of simply forgetting about race. So my, my impulse or instinct uh, prior to these conversations with Cornell was to think, you know, the, the whole problem is people are race conscious. They think of themselves as black or white or Latino or Asian or, or whatever. Um, th- those, you know, those categories are just damaging and destructive uh, let's just stop thinking about that altogether. Let's not only be colorblind in our public policy, which I agree we should be in our public policy. Uh, we should not just get beyond uh, abolishing racial preferences and admissions and hiring and so forth. You know, we should just stop thinking of ourselves in this way. And I think Cornell has uh, persuaded me that um, that that is not only impossible, that's probably undesirable, that there are respects in which tradition, history, culture have shaped um, uh, people in ways that um, make them in ways that are more constructive than destructive, or at least not entirely destructive, or in some respects at least constructive, think of themselves as members of a group or a people. So Cornell, speaking of his own African-American identity, will say, I come from a people who has been uh, persecuted for 400 years but has produced such wonderful art and music and uh, literature and so many achievements in the domain of uh, uh, culture and athletics and other areas. And I, I now see that that does make sense in the, in the same way. Uh, so it would justify, for example, having a department of African-American studies in the same way that the identity of Jews as a people uh, justifies having a department of Jewish studies. There's a whole tradition of literature and uh, music and other achievements uh, that are associated with that tradition. And for people from that heritage to identify with that tradition is not a destructive or necessarily destructive or exclusively uh, damaging thing. So there's an area in which I think on some cultural issues, uh, my, my views have, what was Barack Obama's word, evolved. <laughs> Um, so now, now, I think I, 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 I should add, I, uh, I, I think I've filled in a lot since mm-hmm. 1993. So, for example, my work on religious freedom now uh, does not contradict anything I said about religious freedom in Making Men Moral, but I've got a much fuller uh, picture. And that's not just you know, from uh, my own reflection. It's work I've done with you and... Yeah. Sharif and Chris Tollefson and Melissa Moskella and Patrick Lee and all of my various, uh, Bill, Bill Saunders, my various collaborators, mm-hmm. uh, you know, my understandings of those things I think have gotten much richer, but haven't in any fundamental way changed. So, so let me um, follow up on the religious liberty point, um, because in addition to, you know, being a full-time professor at Princeton, you know, you're a visiting fellow or an adjunct, a non-resident fellow, what's the 
Yuval, I'm looking for what's the official title here for Robbie. But you're a fellow here at AEI. You're a professor also at Pepperdine School of Public Policy. Um, you've been involved with a whole host of kind of civic groups. Lots of religion. I mean, you serve on the board of Beckett. Tell us a little bit about your work in the public square defending religious liberty. Because it's a different register of yeah. exchange from what you're doing in the academy. Well, my first foray uh, was uh, I was sitting there minding my own business as a young, untenured assistant professor in 1992 uh, when I got a call from the Office of uh, Presidential Personnel in the White House. And uh, a woman named Connie Horner, Constance Horner, John will know Constance, uh, wanted to know whether I'd be interested in serving on the um, U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Uh, President Bush uh, was leaving office. He'd been defeated in November uh, by President then-to-be Clinton. But he had some positions to fill uh, that uh, before his term was over, and two of those were on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. And it was interesting. Uh, I did not have a big public profile uh, before that. Uh, I had not been involved in the Bush campaign. I didn't have any money to give, so I didn't give uh, the campaign any money. Uh, there was there would have been no evidence that I voted for President Bush, as it happens I did, but uh, you know she wouldn't have known that. But for some reason that I still don't understand, uh, Office of Presidential Personnel reached out to me about joining the, serving on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, uh, and I accepted, and that got me uh, into public affairs in a significant way. And while serving on the uh, the commission, uh, which has, of course, historically, for very good reasons, been associated with the cause of racial justice, uh, in serving on the commission, I, it became clear that our, our our brief extended not simply to racial issues, but to religion and other things. You know, we were we, we were an anti discrimination uh, agency, so I uh, pushed hard, eventually successfully, for the commission for the first time to. Uh, explore and do a report on the question of religious freedom in America. And my concern, the reason that I pushed this was I had the sense that public schools uh, across the country, really, uh, and, and not always on the basis of ill motivation, sometimes, not exclusively, but sometimes on the basis of ignorance, were running roughshod over the religious freedom rights of parents and students uh, ostensibly because they believed that the Supreme Court decisions in the school prayer cases required the complete erasure of religion from public school, which, of course, they don't. So we ended up having, I believe it was three hearings. I worked very closely with Bill Saunders, who was working with me at the time at the commission. Uh, We had this series of hearings and eventually a report which exposed a lot of the, um, uh, well, first, the misunderstanding of the Supreme Court decisions by teachers and school boards and superintendents and principals and other administrators around the country. And second, just the way in which, as I expected, uh, we would find uh, the the rights of parents and students were uh, being uh, run over roughshod uh, by the schools. And so that was an early salvo. That that now sounds uh, very very mundane. At the time, that was something of a of a surprise and and a big deal. And I was glad that we got that ball. Uh, uh, rolling. Since then, of course, you've had very favorable Supreme Court uh, decisions that are, have significantly clarified the law. So it's no longer, you, you can no longer claim plausibly that it's ignorance if you're forbidding a teacher from having a Bible on her desk yeah, or you're yeah. forbidding students from uh, using um, uh, a spare room in the school uh, uh, during um, uh, non-class hours for a religious club when when the school makes available its uh, its rooms for the gay club and the uh, Republican and the Democratic club and so forth and so on. So um, I think my memory is accurate that in addition to this being the 30th anniversary of the publication of Making Men Moral, this is also the 30th anniversary of the passage of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. That's that correct. was also 93. Mm-hmm. The way you tell it, it sounds like religious liberty has gotten a lot better uh, since 93, at least as far as some of the jurisprudence goes. No question about that. But it also seems like the RIFRA coalition has not held together. No, the RIFRA coalition did not hold together. What Ryan is talking about here is when the um, decision in uh, uh, Oregon against um, employment Smith, division. Employment Division of Oregon against Smith was handed down, abolishing the uh, regime of, of um, First Amendment free exercise law that had existed 
from the early 1960s until the early 1990s when the Smith decision was handed down. Uh, when that decision was handed down, it was rejected, it was criticized uh, by people across the political spectrum. The Supreme Court, with that decision, managed to unite against the justices, the ACLU and uh, the Christian Coalition, People for the American Way and the Moral Majority. Uh, Richard John Newhouse, our dear friend and the great uh, conservative, neoconservative uh, Catholic priest and uh, public intellectual, said that the Smith decision had read the Free Exercise Clause out of the Constitution. So all this resulted in this movement joining right and left uh, to do something about the Supreme Court's uh, decision, and the result was the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, first enacted in Congress, then later state Religious Freedom Restoration Acts all over the, all over the country. Uh, that coalition, again, John DiIulio can tell the story better than I can, blew apart really over the cultural issues, over uh, abortion and the sanctity of human life, marriage and sexuality and sexual morality. Um, so long as the issues didn't have to do with those kinds of questions, but had to do with things like um, protecting uh, Native American Indian burial grounds or whether uh, Sikh military officers could wear their... Um, uh, turbans, or whether Muslim um, uh, prisoners could grow short uh, beards, the coalition hung together. But once we were talking about protecting evangelical Christian bakers or uh, Catholic uh, wedding uh, uh, designers, wedding uh, website designers, once those became the issues, or questions pertaining to abortion, the left was no longer interested in protecting religious liberty. And so the coalition split apart. So let's actually um, pick up where you left off there, some of those hot-button cultural questions. I mean, a criticism that you could be um, uh, leveled with, and you probably were leveled mm -hmm. with, is that your views on marriage violated the civil liberties of gay and lesbian Americans. Um, how would you think, how, how did you engage um, during the decade that we were debating marriage? Because you didn't just appeal to um, the Constitution is silent on the question, um, you went a step further. I wrote a book with you and Sharif, <laughs> uh, What is Marriage, Man and Woman of Defense? And what the book, uh, I think it's fair to say, definitively showed is that the real question, the unavoidable question, and the question that nobody, uh, at least on the marriage revisionist side, ever wanted to an answer, ask much, answer much less ask, uh, is uh, what is marriage? Um, now, the Constitution does not provide an answer to that particular question, what is marriage? So here is an area in which you could honestly say the Constitution is silent so that the marriage laws in Idaho do not need to track those in New York. Um, there's, there's room for, uh, constitutionally, room for different uh, uh, policies and understandings of what marriage, in fact, is, although traditionally, historically, all the states... Uh, uh, embraced the conjugal understanding of marriage. That began to erode in the 1960s, especially, or early 70s, with uh, the introduction of uh, no-fault divorce laws in the, in the states. Uh, but once you get focused on the right question, not, that is not who can marry, that's a false question. Uh, it's a question you can't even raise until you answer the real question, what is marriage? Then you can see that nothing in the argument that you and Sharif and I made in any way uh, attacked anybody or undermined or violated anybody's civil liberties. Uh, if the answer to the question we gave was correct, uh, marriage is a conjugal union in the way that we uh, explain and defend it there, then there's simply no question uh, about uh, whether two people of the same sex can marry or whether three people in a po or four or five people in a polyamorous unit can marry or whether marriage can be for five years renewable as opposed to being, for better or worse, richer or poorer till death will repart. We got the answers to all those questions, and then the question will only be, are we going to opt for in our public policy uh, that conception of marriage or not? It's, it's, it was just, I think, a false claim that what we had here was a civil liberties issue. Saying it's a civil liberties issue presupposes an answer to the question, what is marriage? It actually happens to be the wrong answer, but if they're going to presuppose an answer, they think it's the right answer, they should at least defend it. Right. 
but they didn't want to address the question, what is marriage? For, for people who haven't read the book, um, you, you could easily get the impression from what you just said that you're a theologian and that you gave a biblical or a theological defense of marriage because that's the only defense of traditional marriage that is possible. Um, could you say a little bit about, about that? Well, it would surprise, it would surprise if, if, if it's biblical, it would surprise Plato and Aristotle and Musonius <laughs> Rufus and Cicero and uh, Maimonides. Well, I suppose Maimonides is Jewish. Uh, it would surprise the, the great uh, thinkers and theorists and traditions of the East. Um, it's an understanding of marriage that's accessible to human reason, and part of the evidence uh, for that is that it has been widely embraced uh, mm -hmm. across cultures and, and over time. What's, what's novel is the contemporary liberal understanding, I would argue misunderstanding of marriage, as, a sexually, as essentially a form of sexual romantic companionship or domestic partnership. That's a real novelty. That's a genuine novelty. Uh, that's not even known in ancient Rome uh, or, or Greece, even in pagan uh, societies. There are problems with, with the marriage laws of, of uh, or marriage understandings and cultural norms of pagan societies, at least from the point of view of, of defenders of um, marriage of the sort you and I are. But th even they did not embrace this contemporary idea that what marriage is is, especially, is an especially r romantically intense form of friendship, what the pro-same-sex marriage advocate John Corvino describes as your relationship with your number one person. So um, that question was supposed to set you up to say that you're a natural law philosopher. <laughs> I clearly didn't ask it well. Um, but you are a natural law philosopher. You're not a I'm theologian. I'm a natural law philosopher. A lot of people here have no idea what natural law philosophy ask is. Ask Hadley Arcus and Randy Burnett. They're, they're over there. And Russ Hittinger's here. Okay. Yeah, so uh, the, the natural law is uh, the moral law, the body of moral norms and principles, uh, insofar as they are knowable by reason by the use of our intellects. Uh, and uh, natural law pertains not only to the norms that govern our personal conduct as individuals, but also to the conduct of associations we form uh, from the most basic voluntary sorts of associations all the way up to uh, polities, or what would today would call, uh, would call states. So norms of, of, of justice, sound norms of justice, are principles of natural law, what we would call principles of natural uh, natural justice. Um, uh, they are consistent with, uh, the, the ones that I think are sound are, are consistent with the teachings of revealed religion, but they do not rely on uh, uh, those teachings or depend on those teachings for their own uh, validity. Yeah. Um, we're going to get to audience questions in about five minutes. And for people who are streaming this, because this is being um, live, live stream, there's an email address where you can submit questions. It's sophie dot Riziera uh, at AEI.org. Um, so S-O-P-H-I-E dot R-I-Z-Z-I-E-R-I -Z -Z -E -E at AEI.org. So if you want to email a question, it's going to show up on this other iPad. Um, but Robbie, I want to ask you just a, a little more in the time we have before um, going there is uh, when you close explaining natural law philosophy, there are reasons based upon human nature, human flourishing, natural norms of justice, um, you also are a practicing Catholic. Um, you know, after sixty some years, you're getting good at it. Um, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> how? I mean, but you're also at Princeton, where I mean, that's something like a unicorn. Um, how has your experience been um, as a faithful practicing Catholic, who's also an academic philosopher? Has philosophy undermined your faith? <laughs> Have your colleagues all had mass conversions <laughs> in light of your? <laughs> Which way has it cut? <laughs> no, it's gone in exactly the opposite direction. When I had my big conversion experience, it was not a religious conversion experience in, in the strict sense. Uh, but when I had my big conversion experience, which was an intellectual conversion, when for the first time as a sophomore in college, reading Plato's Dialogue Gorgias, which I had been assigned in a course, otherwise I not only wouldn't be reading it, I wouldn't have known it existed. Uh, reading that text, and for the first time, seeing that knowledge was worth pursuing not simply as a means to other ends extrinsic to it, money, power, wealth, fame, prestige, status, getting ahead, but fundamentally and foundationally, knowledge is valuable for its own sake. Once I had that, once I experienced that, once I went through that uh, conversion, I began to question everything. 
I, I realized that almost everything that I had believed prior to this, I believed for either poor reasons or no reasons at all. My beliefs were essentially tribal. I just picked them up, uh, either from my family or from the larger uh, community in which I was. Or I was believing things, uh, and uh, you know, young people, I guess, can be forgiven for this, because I thought these are the things that sophisticated people believe, and I want to be a sophisticated person. These are, people, these are things that the enlightened people, the elite think, and, and I want to be an enlightened person. Mm-hmm. I want to be part of the elite. Well, all of a sudden, because that ancient Greek had taken me by the lapels and shaken me and awakened me, uh, all of a sudden I couldn't do that anymore. I couldn't rely on those beliefs. So everything was on the table. And uh, so I began to try to earn my right to my beliefs by thinking my way through things, by studying, by learning, by talking in a truth-seeking way, not, not, not simply trying to persuade other people or talking for victory. And I found that my political beliefs very substantially changed in a more conservative direction, and my religious beliefs very substantially strengthened. So uh, philosophy, far from undermining uh, my religious beliefs, uh, fortified and extended them. Uh, the same story would be told by countless other people, including so many people in my own uh, wing of the philosophical world, uh, Elizabeth Anscombe, John Finnis, Peter Geach, Alastair McIntyre, Bastian uh, von, uh, von Frossen. You know, so many people who've moved, in the, in the cases of the people I mentioned, from secularism uh, to faith. In my case, from, from faith, but really not a very informed or strong faith, to a to a stronger faith. So I th- I, it's just alien to me to think of philosophy as the enemy of religious faith. Quite the contrary, in my view. All right, so um, last question for me. Um, you wear lots of hats, serving on boards, doing things in the public square, but I, I think the consistent thread through all of those, your, your constant vocation is that of a teacher mm-hmm. and as a mentor. Um, I, I, I'm pretty sure you once described yourself to me as a full-service mentor uh, after you sent two bottles of wine to a restaurant where Sharif was about to take a young lady that I set him up with on a first date. That's true. He's now married to that young lady. Um, Three children. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> so can you just reflect? Lots of your former students are in the room. Um, can you reflect on what's changed in 30 years of teaching and what stayed the same about your own pedagogy, about campus climate? Um, do, you know, do you indoctrinate your students? Like, <laughs> what is your approach to this, and has it gotten easier or harder given yeah. current campus realities? Well, first, what a joy it is to see so many of my former students uh, here, and I know that some others are watching us by live stream or, going, or are going to watch the tape. It's been the great blessing of my life to be a teacher. I didn't imagine when I was growing up that I would ever be a teacher until that encounter that I described with uh, Plato as a sophomore at Swarthmore. Uh, I never would have dreamt in a million years that I would be a teacher, and yet it has been the most blessed and wonderful uh, thing to do. Uh, I'm, uh, if, if someone says or ask me, are you happy with your life? I'd say, absolutely, I'm happy with my life, and in no small measure because... I've gotten to teach such brilliant, uh, wonderful, courageous uh, young men and women. So many of my students are outstanding, uh, not only because they're so darn smart, but also because they have been what I have you know, worked so hard to, to try to get them to be, which is courageous truth speakers. Not, not just determined truth seekers, but courageous truth speakers. Uh, it's just so wonderful to see them out there uh, doing that. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the first thing I would mention is this. You start out at a university as a teacher, as a professor. You're what, 29 years old? You've got students who are 22. <laughs> That's a very small gap. And you, you, you're really afflicted by imposter syndrome because mm-hmm. you realize, I don't know that much more, if anything, than those kids know. So you're doing your best to try to make it seem like you do know more than they know so that you can have your respect. You know, eventually you do what I do, dye your hair gray to get, to get more respect. I'm doing the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> work for me, I think it'll work for you. Uh, but gra- gradually, of course, that gets longer. And, and part, part of what happens then is you're more distant from their culture and the cultural norms and understandings. I mean, hmm. I don't know, the, I mean, I know the names, but I don't know anything about, I couldn't identify a song by the by, the singers they listen to or the musicians that they that they like. Uh, they don't pick I, banjos. 
No, they, they, that's this much I can I can tell. They don't they don't pick banjos. They haven't they haven't become that enlightened yet. Um, but uh, it, it changes the relationship that you have with your your students, and and you become more parental uh, in your relationship with your uh, with your students. Um, so there's that. Uh, now changes in the culture that have affected students. Um, I still maintain my grading standards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I still demand the level of rigor that you. Well, you actually weren't in I any of my never, courses. No? Yeah, you. Uh, I had you as my research assistant. But um, those of you who are my students, uh, you know, I, I'm as tough on my current students as I was on you guys. And when it comes to demanding analytical rigor, precision, clarity, all those things. Uh, I still assign the same demanding uh, readings, uh, even even to freshmen. I, I do want to stretch them. I do want to make them stretch. The one thing on which I have been simply forced to yield, uh, it's force majeure. There's nothing I could do about it. The one thing I've been forced to yield on is I cannot assign the quantity of reading that I did for your generation. Huh. And I can't help but think that that has something to do with the shrink, shrinking of the attention span. Of, of our students. And I know this because it's not the slackers. I don't have that many slackers. Right. They don't take my courses. They're afraid. Yeah. But, um, but even, you know, my very best students, you know, cannot do the, can't manage the quantity of reading that an earlier generation yeah. of my students took as just normal. So that leads me to think it's not any moral defect or laxity in them. It's just something has happened to the attention span. Now, my pal John Height thinks that has to do with social media and uh, devices, devices and, yeah. and things like that. That could be. I just don't know. But I know that, that, the, that the phenomenon is real. The, yeah. there, there is a shortening of the, uh, the attention span. But I find students, at least the students who come to my classes, are willing to question the dominant orthodoxies, not only on the university campus but out there in the culture. They're willing to think critically and not fall into tribalism so they don't react to the craziness on the left by simply saying, oh, whatever people on the right say or however right word you can go is the right place to be. They're thinking for themselves. I love this. I absolutely love this. They're thinking for themselves. They're thinking critically. They're not thinking tribally. Uh, they, they don't just fall into, into categories. Uh, they, they're willing to work hard. The, the, the shortening of the attention span is one thing, but that's not the willingness to work. They are willing to work very, very hard uh, with a view to what? Getting at the truth of things. It's not just, I love this in my students, it's not just that they want to get to Goldman Sachs. It's fine if you get to Goldman Sachs. I'm not, I'm not remember James Madison program, Princeton University, if you get to Goldman Sachs. But... <laughs> It is end of the year giving time. Yeah, <laughs> but that's not what's driving my students, and 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 th this is yeah. an awful lot of students, right? This isn't just like three kids. Mm -hmm. uh, they really are interested in getting at the truth of things, and doing things with their lives that really, really matter. You know, I, I distinguish. I my students, those of you who are my students, have heard me uh, go on ad nauseum about about this. There are things in life that matter, but not all that much. Wealth, fame, celebrity, status, influence, power. Those aren't bad things. Those are good things in the sense that you can do good things with them. But they're not good in themselves. They matter, but not ultimately. They don't matter that much. Then there are things that really matter. Faith, family, friendship, knowledge, honor, integrity. Those are the things that really matter. And what I love about my students is they've got their priorities right their focus is on the things that really matter, and that enables them to put into proper perspective the things that matter, but not all that much. Yeah. So we're going to open it up to questions. I'll, I'll just highlight that the longest answer Robbie gave was to the question about teaching and his students, which I think reveals something about what actually animates him and gets him excited. Shortest answer was about John Rawls. He's not very <laughs> excited about Rawls. Longest answer about uh, teaching and um, students. Um, so yeah, we have uh, time for questions. We'll go right, right. I think the microphone's right behind you even. Well, Just wait for the microphone so the people online can hear as well. Well, speaking as someone who is one of the online audience, and that's very important because I've heard Sharif and Robert George and Ryan Anderson and, 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 and 
conference with Hadley Arcus and Hadley and uh, Randy Burnett, those are really vital for the people outside of the privileged sphere. I'm just, I'm just not able to come to Washington D.C. It's just expensive and so forth. But I want to ask you about the French, the friendship aspect that mm -hmm. Dr. George, in your book and elsewhere, you often talk about the inst that you don't like friendship to be instrumental. But your own friendship is very helpful in very practical, prosaic, and dedicated and, and kind and selfless ways to your students, writing letters of reference, I imagine, oh, yeah. arranging for clerkships and helping them in myriad ways. And is there such a thing as, and, and this, uh, is there such a thing as good instrumentalism? And the second question is, could Ryan Anderson address what it's like to, to, to segue from being a mentee to being your friend? And when do you realize, oh. I'm Robert George's friend? I'm now, and that's true of many people in this room. What's it like to realize, I'm grown up? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Hope, for that uh, first question, the one directed at uh, me. Well, it's certainly true that I spent an awful lot of my time writing letters of recommendation. I have large numbers of students because my lecture courses are, are big, and many of them want to go to law school. Others want to go to uh, graduate school. I would encourage anybody uh, out there who has this particular charism or, or gift to invent, please, some new adjective, adjectives and adverbs <laughs> because I'm, you know, after 39 years of writing letters of recommendation, my letters of recommendation for my great students are all starting to sound alike, and, and I need new <laughs> adjectives and adverbs, so please uh, help me. Um, yeah, um, I, I would be disappointed uh, in my students if they only loved me for my letters of recommendations, if they treated our relationship <laughs> as instrumental in that way. But I've been blessed, Hope, um, to have what at least seemed to me, unless my students are tricking me, as genuine Socratic friendships with my, uh, with my, with my students. Uh, for, first of all, I'm trying to learn with them in the court. My, my way of teaching, as I think you know, is uh, is di dialogic or dialectical, and so I'm trying to learn with them as we as we work together, and often I do uh, learn. I learn a lot from my uh, from my students, um, and there's something valuable in that relationship as such. And my sense is that my students understand that, and it's not just that they want me to get information from my head into their head, much less the even more vulgar thing of. They just want a good recommendation from somebody who's got a good reputation with these law schools or no Supreme Court justices that will give them clerkships and, and things like that. But I do think that part of the job of being a teacher is that you, this is what, part of what I mean by being a full service teacher, is that it's a lifelong commitment. You, um, you, you help your students for as long as you're around and they're around. Har Harvey Mansfield has just retired at 90. And he's probably still helping students of his who are in their 60s, you know, if not necessarily with letters of recommendation, uh, you know, with advice, with support, uh, you know, on a, a phone call or these days, I guess, an email message or a text message or something like that. Um, so I don't see those instrumental aspects as necessarily in any way undermining the intrinsic value of the friendship. But it's important, I think, for all concerned, certainly for both parties in the teacher-student friendship, for them to understand that what's foundation and fu foundational and fundamental is the, is the friendship at all. Now, friendship is always united around some common good. You, there's no such thing as a friendship that's not united, where the integration of the friends with each other is not around some common good. And here, the, the good is... Truth. In, in other relationships, it's something else. But in the teacher-student relationship, it is the good of truth. That's what they're working on uh, together. But enjoying and celebrating uh, each other and their bond in that, uh, in that common pursuit. Now, Ryan, you can answer your question. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, uh, two things to say uh, um, here. One is that I can, um, for those of you who don't know uh, Professor George's um, teaching demeanor, uh, he always dresses like this in the three-piece suit. I mean, I think I've seen him dressed down in a two-piece suit maybe once. And he has his students refer to him as Professor George, not as Robbie. Uh, lots of faculty at Princeton, first-name basis. I can remember several years into being his research assistant. I'm now a grad student when I first got an email that was signed, you know, all best Robbie, rather than <laughs> best Professor George or something like that. And that's when I knew, all right, we've now turned a corner. Because even I mean, for the two yeah. years that I was at Witherspoon, the two years that I was at First Things, Emails were, dear Professor George, and then whatever I had to say. Um, and when he started signing them as Robbie, I could see that was one. And then um, 
another kind of transition point was, I don't know, like a decade or so ago, I had a personal setback um, and I more or less got depressed. And like the two people who talked to me the most out of it were Robbie and Sharif. And there was a, I would say that something clicked. Now, I mean, like Robbie and I, Sharif, Robbie and I, we have a signal chat. So it's encrypted. So the Biden people can't read it, <laughs> we hope. But I mean, like we're exchanging probably dozens of messages on a daily basis on average. Um, and it's not just about the work that we're doing together. Um, you know, three days ago, Sharif, you sent us a picture with all of the grandbabies of your kids. Robbie gives us updates on how his parents are doing. Um, and there is something very beautiful about that because I don't have that relationship with any of the music professors that I had at Princeton. Remember, I was a music major. Um, but I now have that with Robbie. I have that with some of my professors um, from grad school. And there really is something uh, nice about that. Um, Ryan, you'll remember uh, in 2015, about this time of year in 2015, uh, I, I was um, struck oh, down of by a, course. Okay. Uh, it was a medical emergency. In, you almost in, died. In, yeah, where I almost died. And you know, I literally got, had a doctor say to me, we're not sure whether you'll wake up in the morning. And um, so what I did, do you remember what I did? No. I sent you and Sharif and Joel and uh, Mike, oh, I don't no, know if yes, you were on yeah. a, a note assigning you guys all tasks for your future. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember that do you now. Remember that? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we do have a question online, so I, I, I want to honor that. The, the question here is: Will people act morally without a belief that God will judge them after death? Some people do. Uh, there, there are people who do not believe in God, and I think they're telling the truth and saying they don't. Now, whether at some level there's a kind of God awareness, you know, some people claim that, and I'm not sure. You know, maybe mm-hmm. there is, even among professed atheists, that some level there's sort of a, a God awareness that they themselves are not. Uh, conscious of, but there are certainly people who who don't believe in God and who live virtuous lives. It's just the reality. Another question from the audience. Yeah, Chris Wolf. Uh, microphone's coming right behind you. Hey, Robbie. Uh, going back to making men moral, I yeah. just felt like I was going back to a different world, hmm. you know. And a lot of it has to do with with John Rawls and how dominant he was. Uh, at the yeah. end of the 20th century, and now it just kind of strikes me as irrelevant, you know? And he was very sincere, I think, as, yes. as far as I know, but it always did seem like a parlor game where you came up with this really interesting way of coming up with neutral reasons that would induce non liberals to arrive at liberal answers, or, or at least answers <laughs> that advance liberal causes. And so it, it was, in some ways, almost hard for me to take. Seriously, it did seem like a, a part of our game. Now it just seems like irrelevant. Yeah. You know, did, how many liberals now care about constructing neutral arguments, <laughs> inducing us all to have agreement on some common political theory? Yeah. When was the last time you heard about an overlapping consensus of public yeah. reasons <laughs> for whatever the woke ideology of the day is? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm tempted to leave it there, but we do have two minutes and we have another hand. So, <laughs> I, I do think Professor oh. Rawls was sincere. Yeah, yeah. Now, I don't think that everyone associated with the liberalism uh, uh, of which Rawls was the dominant figure were sincere. I, yeah. I, I do think some people saw the way the game could be played and, and wanted to play it. So. Oh, yeah. You use the anti-perfectionist um, crowbar to open open the way in, so you could eliminate the existing, basically biblical and natural law-based understanding of morality that informed our laws and institutions, and and evacuate the content of those, and then into that vacuum would come substantive liberalism. But I, I think Rawls himself genuinely wanted to find a genuinely neutral uh, uh, position. Now, the, you're, you're right. The thing that made it look like a parlor game is that even Rawls himself would invariably <laughs> end up with a defense of a substantive liberal outcome, although claiming it was derived from neutral principles, not from liberal, substantive liberal principles. What I'm asking, though, is why is that a 
just a different world that's been left behind. Why well, you- ask Mark Tushnet, right? Uh, Mark Tushnet, the famous left-wing Harvard Law uh, professor, who said a few years ago, "We won. The culture won. war is over. <laughs> we won. You guys lost. There's no need to play nice with you guys." You should be treated the way the defeated yeah. Japanese and Germans were treated after World War II. I, I think that's the attitude of people who were not so sincere, not as sincere as Professor Rawls was. We won. You guys lost. Get used to it. We're now imposing our substantive vision on you guys. So I think we're going to have to make that the last question just to keep on schedule. Um, the next panel starts in 15 minutes. Um, restrooms, you go out this door, make a left, go to that, that central uh, foyer, and they're down a level. Um, and pl- please be back here on time so we can keep on schedule. And then join me in thanking Professor Jordan. Oh, thank you. Thank you.